I found a pretty cool tool inside GitHub that allows us to compromise our different accounts on the same system we're in. All we need to have is admin access. And now you may ask, okay, but what's the meaning of that and why do we need to use this at all? And I can say that in some edge cases where EOSAS dumping, for example, is not possible or the NTLM hash is completely disabled, it makes more sense to let them move to other users, which can also be admin or might have different privileges. So in cases where you don't have the possibility to dump EOSAS or it's not needed because NTLM uh, hash is uh, NTLM authentication is disabled, or you cannot crack the hash, I think that's a pretty cool alternative. Now, I'm not sure how exactly this tool works. Now, the whole credit goes to the creator itself, it's not to me. I'm just going to showcase the tool, the technique behind, and we're going to try to understand the source code, but the whole credit goes to the creator, which I cannot pronounce his name pretty much fine, but I guess, I guess it's good. <laughs> yeah, so first we're going to give it a try. I'm going to showcase you my environment, what you're going to do. We're going to try the tool, see if it works at the first place. And then we're going to go and try to analyze the source code. So if you are new to my channel, welcome. I'm Elsek and I'm doing red teaming or hacking videos. And this is my environment. I'm usually showcasing my environment because I think it's nice to see the whole picture and to see the map of the attack surface, which helps us be uh, more efficient. So this is going to be the attack we're going to do. Now here I have a Kali VM, which is external to my internal Active Directory. Now my internal Active Directory is overutilized on a powerful PC, which is next to me. And pretty much it has a PSN's firewall, which acts as and mimics a real life example of a firewall, essentially uh, blocking inbound traffic and allowing outbound traffic and also having specific port forwards for specific services and that's it. So in this environment, I cannot attack all internal systems, but I can attack only the exposed one from the firewall which is, I guess, a mimic of a real-life network environment. Right, okay. Now, we are here on SQL01, which is my SQL server. And we are on this server as two users. So on the one hand side, I'm using an interactive logon, and I walked in as my SQL1 user, or actually not that. Wait, it's not here. So here on this SQL1 server, we have a first interactive logon with my SQL1 user. So this is the first session we're gonna have. And there it is, we have now walked in. And also to simulate our environment so we can test the tool, I've also did a remote desktop as a domain admin. So here I did a remote desktop as a different user. My user is, uh, to that, which is a domain admin and definitely admin to that system, so we can test the tool. And therefore, we have two sessions. So our environment is complete, and we have two sessions on one system. And let's imagine we have uh, access to the current user which we have now. And now we can try to find a way and use the tool to execute commands from the other user on the same PC. Now, ideally, when you are uh, when you're trying to do such kind of behavior, uh, of course, the first thing would be to see if there are multiple sessions in the first place. Because if you are not the, if you are the only session on the system, pretty much there's nothing else to be hijacked. Right. Makes sense. Okay. So with that, what we can do is do QUser. And this native command, QUser, is going to actually give us details about different sessions on our system. In that case, we can see we have two sessions. The first session with ID1 is going to be for SQ1, the user which I used to log in. And then the tl to that is using RDP. And then we have the ID uh, session with ID2, which is going to be the one we are using now. Okay. Now, since we now have uh, two sessions, we can try to use the tool, but there are more ways on how we can try to enumerate the sessions. Because, for example, if for whatever reason an EDR is blocking QUser command, 
or it raises a word based on it, or it raises the score based on it, uh, then we can use different examples for that. Now, one of the examples can be also to use UW install, like that. So we can also have the session IDs. And on top of that, I also developed a small C Sharp tool that also helps with that. So here, of course, I'm going to publish the code on my GitHub so you guys can have it and use it, essentially. It uses some Windows API to achieve the same thing. Now, I've also downloaded the tool there. So if we do sessions view, session view.txe, this is the tool I just compiled, which is going to be uploaded to my GitHub. There you can see we also found the sessions. And now we can see the user SQL1 is on the session 2. We have our user on session 3 and so on. Now, is it the same with two user command? We have SQL1, let's use SID1. Here, ID1 is SQL1. Yes, yeah, so it's exactly the same. So, what we need for the session hop tool is actually the ID of the session. And it works quite simple. And of course, after the demonstration, we're going to go into the source code and try to understand what's actually doing behind the hood. So here, I've already... Can I zoom in? Uh, I don't think it's possible. Never mind. I think it's... Oh, actually, I need to do it like that. Sorry. Okay. Uh, now, I think you better see the, the commands now. Okay. Uh, and now, since we have a session, we verify the IDs with uh, multiple ways. Uh, now it's actually time to try the tool. Now the tool... Oops, my bad. Let me check if everything's all right. Looks like it. Okay. Now the tool is very simple to use. All we need to do is run sessionhub.exe and it's going to give us the help menu or how it's supposed to be executed. Now here it needs the session ID and the path to the executable on the file system. Now one cool trick that might be is to also specify an SMB path, not just a path to the local file system, but a path to a remote chair if you have some evasion problems. In some cases, that might help. Okay. Now, here, on my Kali system, I'm running a sliver C2 framework. And now I've generated a sliver beacon, which I call beacon.exe. Now, I've transferred this beacon.exe via Python HTTP server, and this beacon.exe is actually inside CM beacon, just to be easy with the path. So ideally, of course, you need to make sure that the beacon itself is not detectable, but that is a topic for another video. And now with that, we can try sessionhub.exe. We need to specify the session ID, and in that case, since we are Peltozat with session ID 2, we are targeting SQL1 with session ID 1. So to make a lateral movement to a different user on the same system. So with that, we can do sessionhub.exe. In that case, the session ID is 1. And remember, we are looking at that number here. And then we specify the path to the beacon. In that case, it's C beacon RTXE. Run it. And now, because that's the behavior of the sliver beacon, we have to wait a little bit more. I think in, in, in about a minute, oh, we should be able to see it. So let's just give it a little bit of time. Okay. Uh, now, as mentioned, I'm going to also publish the session view tool on my GitHub so, we can, so you guys can have access to it. And let's now wait for the beacon and see if something's going to appear. These are my current beacons right now. If everything's fine, a new one should pop up. Come on. Come on, there it is, and we have the beacon. And not only do we have the beacon, but as you can see, the beacon with ID AE49, which is that one there, is indeed this SQ1, which indeed proved that we can water move to different user on the same system if we have admin rights to do so. Now, it's not possible to do the other way around. So, for example, if we do go here, 
and let's say let's say we want to use the same session hop stuff let's say we want to use the same session hop stuff but as a wall previous user so for example now if i go to my c and now from there i do session hop or q user and then session hop with the ID of two with the C beacon, ideally that should not be possible. But let's give it a try. I mean, why not? So in that case, I'm executing the session code binary from a low previous user, which I am, and try to overtake the high previous user, which I don't think should be possible, but let's just see. All right, so now we have a beacon, and I think now it's time to look at the source code to determine whether or not, uh, or exactly how, this tool actu actually works. And of course, if I need some help, I'm going to use AI for that to make understanding a little bit more easy. So here, let's go to my command tool, and we have the session hop there. All I did is I used its visual GitHub, and I just cloned and compiled. So I did not use the pre-compiled version because I'm a little paranoid, so I've just downloaded the, the project and compiled it myself, and now it's time to look at the code. Okay, so here, the first thing that's clear is that actually the code is super short. So the full length of the code itself is like 43 lines, which I did not expect. This is the main from where the code is going to start, and this is going to be uh, our class with some interface to it. IHX help pain server. So I guess that should be some kind of uh, window specific objects. I think so. But the fact is, the code works. Yeah. Okay. Now again, we start with the main. So with the main, the first thing we do is define an if statement. And that if statement is going to actually check how much parameters we specify. And for example, if we specify less than two parameters or more than two parameters, it's going to give us this error which we saw at the beginning. So for example, if we do it like that, you can see... Okay. <laughs> I didn't expect that, but never mind. It's fine. Okay. I don't know why that works, to be honest. <laughs> But generally, it checks for the parameters. Oh, because... Oh, it's less than 2. Yeah, sorry, my bad. So if the parameters are less than 2, it's going to show us this message. But if they are more than 2, it's going to actually try to work. So ideally, this would be something like... And... Args.length is going to be... Bigger than 3. Yeah. Or we can try different than two which also going to work and you have many options to that so in that case if you compile and specify more arguments now it's going to fail okay and this should be over okay now after we parse the arguments and we are sure that they are exactly the same number the, the needed number which in that case is two then we do a new session id and that's going to be parsing the first argument which is going to be the provided id and then we have a string variable, executable path, which is parsing the second argument, which is going to be the path to the binary or the beacon we want to execute. Then we just do a print statement to see uh, that it's successful, the arguments are fine. And then we have ihx help paint server. We define some kind of a server. Bind to moniker. And then some session and some ID. I'm not sure what's that. Then we define a target of object URI. And then this is new URI. We, we get the path. Okay. And then we execute the path from the target. So these two lines are, I know what they are. So these two lines are, we define the targeted path for the, for the beacon itself. And and in, in the next line, line 35, we just execute it. So I guess the way of execution is it needs to be handled through 
this kind of object. So server that execute. And this server that execute in order to find the binary, we need the binary to be parsed inside as a URI object. So this line actually parses the path of the binary, and the second line actually executes the binary, which is fine. But I'm not sure what kind of server is that. So let me try to do more research. Oh, we directly see post injection. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's a nice book. Book name. Okay, or just ask AI. Let me just ask AI for that. Or just like that. Let's copy the full code. All right, let's see what the AI is going to say now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. The code is, just, is, is a session hopping exploit that leverages Windows help system component. Ah, okay. To execute the program in a different user sessions. All right. What it does, it takes two argument that you know, binds to a com object in the specified session using Marshall bind moniker. Uh -huh. So we bind to a com and then execute a specific program in that session by calling the execute method of this com interface. Right. So we have different com interfaces that are capable of executing user provided code, I think. Not all coms can do that, but I think some of them can. And that's, I guess, one of them. The key to exploit this mechanism is using the session moniker session id new CLS, CLS id to instantiate a com object in a different window session. Ah, all right. So that makes more sense because now we have session two sessions. From one of the sessions, you create a new com object for the other session, and then you invoke the execute from the name of that com object, which ideally is from the context of the new session. I don't know if I get that correct, but if I explained it correct, but let me know in the comments. All right. So the IHX helps pain server is a com interface, and that's the hard coded GUID we have here. And that's the one. HCA, yeah, same thing, yeah. That's part of the Microsoft Help system. It was designed for with the Visual Studio Help Viewer and Windows Help Infrastructure. The interface provides methods to, yeah, display help task, execute files. <laughs> okay, that that's it. Okay, the execute method is vulnerable. Is the vulnerability here? And yeah, we get we get it. Nice. Yeah, uh, so that, that was the stream. I learned also a lot because I think the, the future of execution and the, and the future of, let's say, attacks is the com object themselves. So they are huge, they are super huge, and things like com hijacking are the real deal. So I want to say massive thanks for watching. I want to shout out the creator of these two and for the simplest but working code he did. And I kind of appreciate this kind of code because sometimes it do not have to be that complicated to work. Right. So full shout out to the creator. I really appreciate you watching, guys. And again, as always, if you have questions, drop them on YouTube, ask the comment section, reach me out in Discord, and also consider supporting me on Patreon. By doing so, you're going to get access to tools, internal videos, and documentation. So you support me, and I support you with knowledge. Thank you so much once again. I want a special, special thank to all of my patrons for their support, and I'm going to see you in the next one. Bye-bye.